Good evening, everyone, and welcome to TNT Episode 9 of Season 2, and this is the finale. Um, and we're here at the pre-show, and we want to acknowledge our sponsor, HSBC Bank Canada. Uh, this is your opportunity to check your audio and check your video, put it up, and let your hair down, pour a glass of milk, tea, wine, or scotch, have some cookies, maybe even a slice of blueberry pie. COVID-19 is still upon us in British Columbia, Canada, and the world. So I'd ask everyone to wear a mask, stay in your bubble, and practice social distancing. So uh, as this is our last episode of season two, we're going to go to full screen now for some commercial chatter. Okay. So our membership drive here at the O'Dane Art Museum is still continuing until March 15th. And if you sign up for a membership, you're still eligible to win a variety of prizes. So tickets are also will go on sale now, or soon rather, for our virtual gala and auction on Saturday, April 24th. And our hosts will be Gloria Makarenko and Fred Lee as well. We'll have a live auction, which is a really integral part of the uh, event. And that will be run by Heffel Fine Art Auction House. And in that auction, we'll have some really major works by both historic and contemporary artists here in British Columbia. Uh, we've got a Jack Shadbolt, a couple of Gordon Smiths, um, a Stan Douglas, and we're very fortunate to have a Dana Claxton. So this is where we get really. So we're going to give you a little teaser here. Uh, and this is a piece that is, oh, geez, it's what is it, six feet high and four feet wide. It's a beautiful work entitled, where's my title? Oh, here it is. The Protector of 2020. And it's an edition one of three. And it's a digital C print. And again, this comes courtesy of Dana Claxton. Thank you, Nadine. We'll roll that out. In addition uh, to those works, we're also going to have a commission piece uh, that Paul Wong is going to do for us. And now we're going to get really tricky. And uh, here we go. Ooh, nice shot. We have a Paul Wong pillow. Oop, oop, oop. And this Paul Wong pillow is made by Sharon Huguet, and they're on sale in our shop. And it's actually a neon image from a piece in the collection, No Thing Is Forever. Thank you, Nadine. <laughs> all right. Uh, so for all your shop needs, go to ordainedartmuseum.com. All right, that was the high pressure part of the broadcast. <laughs> um, so, as I said, uh, the museum remains open Thursday to Sunday, 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. And we're taking every precaution to keep both our visitors as well as our staff safe. Um, the Rebecca Belmore Reservoir exhibition will be on uh, until May 9th. And you can always come and see our incredible permanent collection of BC art as well. So we're going to go to the top of the broadcast. And there we go, full screen. Thank you, Justine. Welcome to season two. And this is the finale of Tuesday Night Talks, sponsored by HSBC Bank Canada. And seeing as this is our last episode of season two, I want to thank all the artists and viewers that have joined us over both seasons one and two. And in these past nine episodes, we've recorded over 3,500 viewers, an incredible feat for this museum. And tonight we have over 400 people registered for episode nine. Non-essential travel is still banned here in British Columbia as are uh, large gatherings. And shortly the province will be rolling out a vaccine program. Tonight, we're back by the flashlight glow. 
in the permanent collection of the Odain Art Museum here in Whistler on the shared traditional territories of the Squamish and Lillooet nations. This evening's focus is on paint up number one. Behind me, it's an ink and on archival uh, paper print. And this photograph is from 2009. It comes courtesy of a gift from Michael O'Dane and Yoshi Karasawa. And now we have the great privilege of speaking to the maker of this wonderful work, Dana Claxton, live from our home office in Vancouver. Good evening, Dana. Hi, Curtis. Hi, everyone. How are you doing tonight? I'm well, thank you. That's excellent. So, um, as promised, we're going to just jump right into this piece, Dana, and perhaps you can begin to discuss the creation and context of this work beside me. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I was thinking about this work and when we were sort of rehearsing earlier, you know, I, I, ha I haven't seen some of these works for a while. And um, for me, I was thinking about this collaborative process with the fellow in the photograph, Joseph Paul, who I had invited to sit for me and to paint up. And so as much as my artist hand is visible here, so is his artist hand that he's painted up for me. And, you know, I'm thinking about with photography and how, you know, there's, of course, backstories to, you know, these images. And it's also there's stories of, you know, what's going on outside of the frame. And, you know, when I think about um, my work, which is engaged in uh, this particular work, uh, thinking of cultural aesthetics, um, as well as uh, socio-political conversations, spiritual conversations, um, uh, the criminalization of Indigenous cultures in Canada, and then also the celebration of cultures. So, um, this this look that he has that he's painted up. Uh, normally would be worn and which he has worn uh, for when he's dancing men's traditional at, at different powwows. So one year at the Kamloopa powwow, he was painted up like this and it stayed with me for, it was eight to 10 years. And then I asked him, would he sit for me and paint up like he did eight years ago when, when, when I saw him at the Kamloopa powwow. So um, there's a lot going on in terms of cultural uh, practice, cultural politics, and what's outside the frame as well. And the scale of this work is, is very particular. Can you speak to the effect of the scale or, or the desired effect? Well, you know, I often say that your materials will sometimes tell you what they want. <laughs> You know, when you're practicing in the studio, you're you're making work or you're playing and experimenting, and you know when those types of that type of magic happens. But materials will tell you what they want, and I and although these were shot with very large uh, format negatives, eight by ten uh, negatives, so they're you know very you know eight by they're eight by ten negatives, very large, uh, so actually essentially could have gone to eight by ten feet, but um, or. Uh, but the idea was uh, it just that they like almost like, you know, um, beckoned to be, yes, the size. Somebody has said, is it because did I want them to be sort of in your face <laughs> kind of um, <laughs> position? But and they just the, and, and not about sort of monumentalizing everything either in terms of that everything has to be large to be impressive or to have impact. But for this particular uh, look in his face and also thinking about the gaze and the imperial gaze, the Western gaze. And, you know, so he's like returning that. And so it, uh, you, you needed to see his eyes. And the, the, the nature of the design of the, the black of the eyes and the red of the cheeks and lips, can you comment on that a little please? Sure. Um, so the the design around his eyes is very specific to uh, you know Northwest Coast style of uh, of iconography, 
And um, the red is, is natural paint. So it's, it's natural paint that he's harvested himself. And so I, I just, the fellow himself, Joseph is uh, Salish and Okanagan and also from the North. So it's this sort of, he, he, he's intertribal himself. And so also the look of how he has painted up here is intertribal as well. And the companion piece to this, paint up number two, uh, perhaps you could comment on, again, how he painted himself up in this uh, image. Well, it's quite lovely because I haven't seen this for so long, but the, the red that sort of goes around is just sort of, it's, for me, it's indicative of sort of sa sa Salish, form, Salish form lines and just sort of that wave, that, that sort of subtle wave. The other thing that you had mentioned when we were speaking earlier is that, you know, while the darkening of the eyes, you know, it's, it's a, a bit of a threatening glare, but he is a very sort of sympathetic looking fellow when you really gaze at that. Can you talk about the contrast between that? Well, just thinking about the other one too, which is pretty, you know, fierce looking. Like when you first see that image, it's, it's, it's pretty fierce. And, but at the same time, like, <laughs> he's so gentle. And so it's like this sort of a, um, a you know, I, I suppose like a, a duality in, in, in some ways. He's this, you know, perhaps the gentle warrior. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very good but character. I mean, I like I said, like there's, it's sort of what's, in thinking about talking with you, I was thinking what really is going on with my work sometimes. And it's really about, you know, as much as what's outside the frame, it really is. And so if we think of, you know, I'm obviously interested in identity, the stereotype, um, uh, you know, the, the fierce Indian, the warrior Indian, the eco Indian, and, uh, and it, you know, all these sort of different um, stereotypes that are compiled and, you know, piled onto in indigenous bodies. So that's, that, that has a, a role within these images as well. Excellent. And that's a good lead into the, the next image that you provided us with, the Mustang Sweet family portrait, Indians on a Blanket, which also features uh, Joseph. And this is a work from 2008, and it's a sea print. So perhaps you can kind of talk about the composition of this work. Um, as a filmmaker and a photographer, um, you know, I, I tend to work with people for a long time. And so some people I've worked with for 30 years, 25 years. And so this particular work um, was commissioned by the Alternator Gallery in Kelowna. And it was during the uh, 20, was it the 2010? The Olympics were here in 2010. So it was part of that sort of the cultural Olympiads. And it was a lovely, generous commission to get from a very humble artist-run center, and um, which I believe was also partially uh, sponsored by um, the Audien Foundation. And um, so I was thinking about mobility and freedom and autonomy. Sort of these are reoccurring themes in my work, autonomy, always wondering, you know, where is autonomy? Where, where is it? Where is it, you know, how, how has autonomy been legislated in Canada? And so this was about autonomy. And then when I thought about autonomy and uh, freedom, I thought about mobility. And then I thought about the Mustang, the, the pony, and then thought about uh, Black Elk and his lovely visions of the, of the horse dance, which is still uh, performed uh, you know, to this day. And so that was sort of the foundation of some of these works of the Mustang Suite. And so there's others that have all the Mustang in them, but now this is the family, the, the Mustang's not here. And so it's thinking about, you know, the cliche of indigenous people on a blanket, Indians on a blanket. But it was also one of my students one time at Emily Carr asked me, um, they said, did we, you know, win? Uh, because we had chairs 
and so thinking about you know did the, the did the did the did the, the the colonizer win because they had chairs and we had blankets and we were sitting on the ground and you know there's all that the the conversation around you know indians on wounded knee bent knee looking up to the you know the the great explorer or some type of savior so I decided just to put the chair in the middle of the blanket. And so it's, like I said, there's a lot of backstory to these images. <laughs> That's excellent. And, uh, you know, it's a very contained portrait. Uh, I do recall seeing those two women actually in another image on Mustang bicycle. So it's all part of a, a larger suite. Um, the next one, uh, we move forward in time to 216, and this is cultural belongings. And again, if you could put this into context in the larger body of your work and, and exactly what's happening here. Well, also um, thinking about cultural aesthetics and cultural practices and how they maintain, how they transform, how they're fluid how they've been outlawed and, um, and also how they're celebrated. And so this particular image, cultural belongings, is uh, there's a lot of um, Lakota and Plains aesthetics within this image as opposed to Northwest Coast where we are. And so collapsing ideas of the ancient with the contemporary, the ancient with the uh, future. And so there's the, the past, the present, and um, and the future all kind of wound up in this, and it, that continues to be a theme uh, within a lot of the images that I create, and especially the the family portrait one. Um, so she's holding a dance stick. It's a horse dance stick, and it's a it's more of a sculptural item as opposed to one that men. That, although men do use them for dancing, this one was made more as a sculpture. Um, women generally wouldn't be carrying this dance stick. But it's, you know, it's there's a, a sculptural piece. And then I made her headdress, um, thinking about uh, the politics of who gets to wear a headdress. And I'll talk about that uh, in a little while. And then her elk robe that she's wearing, um, the elk for Lakota women as well as Crow and different um, Plains women, we wear elk teeth uh, for various um, uh, relational. Uh, relations with the elk and so she's wearing her elk robe and so she's bringing all of this with her she's bringing this culture with her she's bringing this history with her and then um i call these items that, that they're made to be ready as opposed to the ready made they're made to be ready the shield is made to be ready to protect yourself in war the the bustle is made to be ready to hold your dance bustle the par flesh containers are made to be ready to hold your water or your other belongings. And so it's everything's made to be ready as opposed to a, a, decor, a decorative object that has no function. And uh, obviously the made to be ready is a, I, I suppose, a nod to the surrealist ready made that you've kind of flipped on its head. How does your work relate to surrealism? Um, well, I think of the, uh, you know, sort of the supernatural is is because is, my films that I made, oops, people have often commented that they're surreal. And, and I think they're more within a, the idea of the supernatural and, and that that whole world. <laughs> <laughs> what I'll say about this is so this was my first firebox as well. And again, this was, you know, I took this image and then sat with it for about four, almost five years before I released it because it was very demanding in my studio wanting to be a firebox, but I was unsure about making a firebox and, um, and then eventually did make one and then now haven't stopped since. Can you, for our viewers that are unfamiliar with the term firebox, can you kind of expand on that a little? Well, they are backlit um, Duratran prints. And certainly in Vancouver with a number of artists, they're called light boxes. 
and it was a domain that I wasn't sure. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I wasn't sure if I was welcomed or, you know, that it was a terrain that was already well kind of claimed. And, but they just demanded, she just demanded that she wanted to be one of these backlit prints. And so um, through various, uh, uh, conversations with my studio assistant actually and thinking you know what you know how, how can I make this and uh, realize that I don't have to make a light box because I can make a firebox. <laughs> <laughs> you bring up a good point though um, many artists that come to Vancouver and then settle in you know feel that that predominant pull, pull of the photo conceptualist theme what was your experience in trying to negotiate that space for your own practice? Well, it was one, it was just that tussle with the light box and the fire box. But, you know, I mean, there's some extraordinary work that's been made. And, you know, I've been influenced by all kinds of art practices as well as the natural world here and the spirit of the mountain and, and Vancouver art and Vancouver video art and performance art. So, um, I cherish it all, really. And the other thing that you've mentioned uh, both earlier today and this evening is that you often sort of pause, in, in some cases, years at a time before you'll release an image. Is that just part of becoming comfortable with that image, or are there other strategies at play? Um, that's a great question. It, it's, it's not even a strategy. You know, I'm, not that, I'm not quite that strategic, but it just the work has to take its time. You know, materials and work, it, it just takes time. Okay. So um, the next uh, few images, uh, the first one is called Headdress Series from 2018 and 19. And per perhaps you can discuss how this body of work came about and uh, provide us with a little insight uh, for each of these uh, five images and, and we'll dig into the, the leftmost uh, as we go. Okay, um, so thinking about the headdress, because in, in the cultural belonging piece, I made this headdress and that was, of course, inspired by you know, wearing um, indigenous jewelry and sort of being petted while you're wearing it, you know, and, and uh, uh, so I made that headdress to say, here's all of my indigenous beadwork, here's all, of, and my sisters, and here it is, and I, so I made this headdress. And, but then also, you know, part of the, what's outside of the frame is, you know, the politics of who gets to wear a headdress and, um, and, you know, thinking of like a tribe called a Red who've asked people not to wear headdresses at their concerts. Are you pointing to me? No, oh, oh. sorry, I point to a light that went out. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, and so, you know, there's, there's, there's the, you know, the, the politics of head, who, who can wear these headdresses. And they're also, you know, in, in my own Lakota culture, um, they're called war bonnets. And you know, only certain people get them. And and you know, in our family, my uncle, who's also the Chinupa carrier, the pipe carrier of our reserve, he was he he has uh, he has our community one. Um, so I asked different people I knew if they would sit with me and bring their own cultural belongings, and I would make this headdress for them to you know to sit. And and so it was uh, um, starting from the left to the right. Um, that was D in a combination of, of beadwork from all different makers. And then Shade, who um, lovely, these lovely handmade peyote fans that she has and a lot of Navajo jewelry, and then the beaded baseball caps, and then a, a self-portrait of uh, collections of mine and my sisters, which is also from intertribal from many different communities. And then Connie, who is, she's beaded all of her own. She's an incredible uh, barrette maker. So she's beaded all of these uh, barrettes. They're actually barrettes. And then there's a purse with hers. And then the end one is Janine. And uh, most of her work is from uh, the Yukon. And so the thing about beadwork is that 
you can tell where somebody's from from the design of their beadworks. And so um, with Janine, um, with some of her family beadwork and her and 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 who have made most of this is from her family who have made it, but you can see very specifically the northern flowers. And then what I love is the is the baseball cap and the toque of bringing you know the the practice of beadwork into contemporary hip hop culture. And the obscuring of of each face can you can you sort of explain why that's an integral part of this each image? Well, I think you know the my my continued inquiry and sort of ponderance and wondering about, you know, the imperial gaze and or the settler gaze or all of these different gazes upon indigenous bodies. And, and you know, so it's like, it, 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 I'm thinking about the gaze, but I'm not thinking about uh, the veil at all. And so people have asked me about that. I'm, I'm more thinking about the indigenous female body that's behind this headdress and you know she's looking at you per se because you know she can see see through this. So she's she is looking back. Okay. So um, we're going to move to um, two last works that um, again you've released. You indicated that you took these pictures in in 2015, but they've just been recently re released this year, and this is. Manhattan Black Fringe One. Thank you. Um, I did another series of Paris and I took my Canon, you know, old my first, I had my first camera when I was 16, an old Canon AE1 and went to Paris one time and took about 300 images. And then um, uh, the presentation house made a book. And so it was just street photography, me walking around, taking pictures, not of people, but of stuff that I saw. And I, initially in Paris, I was looking at, I wanted to see the American Indian in the, in the, in the Paris landscape and found so many images. It was uh, uh, quite unusual, really. I would, wouldn't have thought I would find so many. Um, and so with this one in, in uh, so then I thought, oh, maybe I'll do that in every city. You know, I'll, I'll go and do a walk around and, and, and see what I find. And so this particular one, I wanted to see how many images of fringe that I um, would encounter because I was doing a performance at the Met called Fringed. And so I went and looked for fringe and I found this beautiful black leather fringe dress. Great. And then fringe number two. Yeah, so just a, a different uh, image of it. And so in the series of Manhattan, there's um, about ten images, and they're and they're diptychs. So there's two with each uh, with each object. And also, I should and say, how do you? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. I'm just thinking technically is that. For these, I used um, disposable analog cameras, and that was very specifically wanted to work with that type of grain. And how do you feel as though these kind of, I guess, more street type shots work off against your your highly produced work? You know, it, how, how do you position them in the larger look at your your practice? I guess just um, thinking of process and where this is much more, I mean, both processes are, you know, intuitive and, but just being live, you know, walking with the camera, um, it allows, it, it's a different type of, you know, intuition, I suppose. And I should say, so these are also our, uh, they're dark room, dark room prints or color dark room prints. And, um, and, and, but you can actually on the ones that are on their way right now to Toronto, all of the artifact of the film uh, is in it. So, you know, the, the sprockets and the Kodak and the number are on both sides of these. And have you had an opportunity to exhibit these ever? 
Um, well, they're just on their way to the Ryerson Image Center. And the idea of, you know, putting the sprocket and all the outside information, uh, is that an effort for you to kind of step back and from the image and allow people into your process a bit? Yeah. And just to see, okay. to, to see process, yes. Okay. So that's a, a good segue to the question and answer part of TNT, which we always enjoy. And the first question uh, comes from David in Vancouver. And he asked, can you please talk about your role as an educator? <laughs> My role as an educator. I try to be a generous teacher, I really do, and um, to inspire students and to have them think critically as, you know, what, 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 what critical lens are we going to look at whichever work we're looking at. Sometimes I, you know, show Indigenous work or we'll, you know, we went to see the Cindy Sherman show. It all depends on what's really on the, at the VAG or the Belkin or at some artist run centers. Um, but it's about thinking critically thinking about how they're seeing and, and why they're making art and what is the role of artists? You know, what is it, do we, do we have any type of responsibility to anything? <laughs> you know, do we have a, a responsibility to ecology? Do we have a responsibility to justice? Do we have responsibility to anti-oppression? Do we have responsive? What is what is the role of artists? Is something to I always say think about and and not to say this is what it should be, but just to keep it open, right? Um, but uh, also to let them know that there's room for all kinds of art, and that not everybody is going to have, you know, the art world's demanding. You know, contemporary art is very demanding as what I tell my students and that it doesn't let everybody in, <laughs> you know? And so, but, and if it doesn't know that there's a place for your art in other places. So it's just that, you know, people are creative and want to create and, you know, they might not get in all the biennales that shouldn't define their work. Oh, excellent answer. The next question comes from Mahrain in North Vancouver. And the question is, it appears that your works have been carefully planned and constructed. Do you usually start with a story you want to tell? Thank you for that question. Um, I think I'm, you know, engaged in these really large narratives of Indigenous histories, Canadian history, Canadian colonial history, um, American imperialism, British imperialism, sort of, you know, the whole sort of colonial project. I seem to want to somehow <laughs> bring, <laughs> bring that into a photo, like, and it's, so it's, it's this much, you know, try, trying to put that whole experience into something, right, or that whole analysis of, of you know, um, of uh, both good and bad human behavior, right? And, but, so it does start with a story and also I'm thinking about what, you know, you see things in your mind's eye sometimes and then you bring it out and you want to make it into a picture. And, you know, you gather your sets, props and costumes and those kind of things. But, you know, sometimes things just happen in the studio and, you know, you don't, you know, you, things change sometimes when you're there and you have everybody assembled and everybody's there and and uh, and then you look through the viewfinder and something something else happens. Excellent. Well, thank you for that. The next question comes from Catherine in Whistler and she asks, um, how can our communities better support Indigenous art? Well, thank you for that question. That's a lovely question. Um, well, of course, understanding it <laughs> as much as we can understand art. Sometimes art is, you know, challenging and confusing and threatening and provocative and all of these things that art can be uh, and should be. And we all have different experiences with art. So if we think the artist, you know, has the work in the studio and then takes the work into the, 
the gallery space, which is the home of art. And there's many homes for art, but sort of the official home of art sometimes is the gallery space, the museum. And then the viewer has an experience with that. And so I guess it's what you do with that experience and, in an, and within an indigenous reality of what you know that work might be saying or revealing or unpacking or unfolding. And then what is the viewers, you know, you see it. And then sort of what do you do about that story once you see it? You know, a lot of contemporary indigenous art is looking at, I, you know, injustices, right? So what does the viewer do with that? But of course, by indigenous art is, is, a, is you know, something to, is, is very supportive, but I think it's a, to, to appreciate it and, and, um, and to attempt to understand it and why people are wanting to tell those stories. Thank you, that's excellent. And now we have a question from uh, what I consider our super viewer, Mandeep from Abbotsford. And Mandeep asks, what are your thoughts on how reconciliation is going in Canada? Super viewer, that's, uh, that's great to hear. Um, and thanks for joining us. That's a great question. How is it going? You know, I mean, I think some people don't even know that it is going. <laughs> and so, you know, that's the challenge of it, right? When any, I think when, uh, whenever, whenever there's been hidden histories or suppressed histories or unrevealed histories, and then, um, and then looking at those histories, but then looking at contemporary realities, which reconciliation is about. I, I think that Canada still needs to um, think about what reconciliation is. And as we know, that's a fraught word too. People are now using conciliation, that it's conciliation as opposed to reconciliation but it's you know, about having, being in relations. And so if we think of Canada as being this treaty nation, which it is, but yet still some of those treaties are not being still adhered to, or certainly here on the you know, west coast of unceded territories. It's fascinating you know, when you think about the settlement of Canada and its history and um, you know, this, you know, this red continent, you know, this continent turtle island, was you know was in you know Indian land man right <laughs> and um, and then to have so many different cultures come here and uh, and then and now be at a state of reconciliation it's uh, I, I think it's an amazing time to be here and hopefully we can all find a place on the turtle back Valerie from Vancouver asks and this is perhaps one of our most esoteric questions of the evening. Okay. What is the role of sun and or light in your work? Well, you need a good gaffer, that's for sure. When you're, when you're <laughs> lighting photography and a great light meter and when I'm making films, you know, I really rely on uh, you know, extraordinary team and especially the gaffers and the grip. Thinking of Joseph as well, he's been a best boy on a couple of my films. So he's, we've, he's, we've worked together in that capacity too, for that type of, you know, kind of technical artificial light. But um, sun light is I've recently, uh, which is on its way to Toronto too, did a few uh, images, digital images called Sundancer's Gaze and just gazing at the sun. And uh, so um, I, it wasn't, of course, when I was sun dancing, but it just, I just called it that. So the sun is very important. <laughs> no <one else> is. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> and then finally, um, Pam from Seattle uh, asks, what exhibitions do you have coming up in the future? Um, Thanks for the question. I have a show coming up at the um, Ryerson Photography Center. I want to keep, I think I'm calling it the wrong name. Forgive me, Ryerson. Ryerson Photo Center. 
Um, and it's their lovely new space that they've had for a few years now. So I, I have a show there and I'm showing mostly new work and a lot of work that I've never shown before. I went through my archives and brought out some negatives that are, you know, 25, 30 years old and have made, and they're mostly of landscape in the plains and sort of, so it's uh, in the sky. Oh, great. Well, I'm sure everyone will look forward to seeing that exhibition. So uh, to tail out the program, we'll look at a final few works okay. in this uh, piece uh, featuring iron workers. Can you, again, talk about the context of this work and, and how it came about? Well, there's some questions in the chat there I just saw. The iron yeah. worker. <clears throat> okay, again, thinking about what's outside the frame. And, you know, I'm really thinking about critical class consciousness. I'm thinking about critical race consciousness. I'm thinking about the Mohawk iron workers and indigenous iron workers and just thinking also about the everyday and the everyday experience. And um, so I invited uh, these men to come and sit for me. I took 1500 photos of them. It was a whole day shoot. And, um, you know, they got to be supermodels, <laughs> you know, it was, it was playful and it was fun and um, it was uh, meaningful. And, you know, the, these were men with a lot of dignity and, uh, and a lot of humor. They were so funny. Oh my gosh, we had so much fun. And um, I made a calendar for them because <laughs> I had taken so many <laughs> images and then also made a video flip book that I was inspired by Henry Robodeau to make a big video flip book, like an installation size video flip book that was at the Vancouver Art Gallery a few years ago. And um, so I was, so was thinking about socio-cultural uh, socio -cultural economics and class. And then we have a shot here of the, the sort of the behind the scenes of this shoot of the iron workers. And maybe talk a little bit about your process and how many people are involved behind the camera. Well, you know, just thinking about the um, cultural belongings, like that was about 40 people, you know, it just takes time. And for one, I like to get the studio all set up and then eat you know, before we start. <laughs> so my sister, that's actually her directing somebody, I'm sure, because she's my older sister, but she loves to cook and she comes and makes such beautiful meals for us. And um, so, you know, this work is not done. So, uh, thinking about when I get to just go, you know, with my little camera and take photos and then, you know, going to, you know, just making some of this work takes a lot of hands and a lot of people and a lot of expertise and uh, a lot of uh, kindness and a lot of humor. And um, so this was getting ready for this particular shot. I th yeah, that must have been for, yeah, that was for the, that was for the um, iron workers. And the last image is a rather arresting image of you behind the camera. And maybe you can talk about what you're working on as a filmmaker. Okay, I should say this picture is it, it's an older picture, but it's, it's such a lovely camera to have worked with. So right now I'm um, just finishing a feature film script and I want to make a feature film. I've made several short films, well, you know, from 20 minutes to an hour long experimental dramas, where this new work is uh, a conventional drama, but it's still, um, you know, within the, within my sort of aesthetic choices. But the story is so amazing. And it's called Tipping Andy Warhol. And it's based on a true story of a good friend of mine, Sam Bob, who's from Nanus Bay. And we both went to theater school together in the 80s. And it's such an extraordinary true story. It's a Vancouver story. It's about his coming of age when he was 16 and he worked at the Muckamuck restaurant, which was this famous restaurant on Davie Street that served Northwest Coast food. Upstairs was an art gallery and Andy Warhol came to town and Sam was the head server. And then there was this major strike and, um, and the owner of the restaurant 
brought in Russell Means, the, the founder of the American Indian Movement, to come and talk to these striking Indians. And then there was a number of indigenous drag queens. So there's just sort of everything that I love. There's, you know, art, sexuality, Indians, and uh, drag queens, <laughs> and politics. And because the muckamuck strike was quite significant with this, um, I suppose they were a radical feminist organization called Sorwalk. But it's such a unique West Coast Vancouver story and an indigenous story. So, you know, these things take time to make and, but it, it's um, determined to make it. So we're, we're almost finished the script. I so much look forward to seeing that and hopefully I'll get invited to the premiere. Well, I wanna thank you so much tonight, Dana, for taking us behind the scenes. We have a, a few thank yous that I'll list, uh, but before that, I wanna issue a reminder about the Odane Art Museum's virtual gala and auction on April 24th. That's being sponsored by RBC, Actium Builders, and BD Leaving. And uh, our tickets will go live online this week at odanegala.com. I wanna thank the entire team here at the museum uh, for their perseverance and keeping the momentum of this institution going. I also want to express my respect and appreciation for the ongoing support and guidance of Michael O'Dane and Yoshi Karasawa. The ever generous contributions of our museum trustees and founders, um, and particularly at this finale moment, I want to thank our TNT crew, our director, producer, Justine Nickel, and our quality control controller and pillow thrower, Nadine Hassan. Um, we always have a few shout outs uh, to my dad in Cornwall, uh, to my little sister Susie, uh, to Kathy from Boston, Nora and Amy. Um, and I just want to say that TNT season two finale does not mark the end of TNT. We'll be back mm, probably in the fall with season three. Uh, and lastly, Dana, thank you so much and good night from the shared territories of the Squamish and Lillawatt nations. Good night, Dana. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. How do all we right. get out? <laughs> <laughs> How do we all get out? <laughs>